As a boss, are you finding inspiration in all the right places? Plus, how to respond when employees ask, what does so-and-so do all day anyway? It's ahead now on Boss Better Now. You're listening to Boss Better Now. Please welcome speaker, author, and chronic over-planner, Joe Mall. That's so true. Welcome again, Boss Heroes, to the weekly show that offers advice, humor, and encouragement to bosses everywhere. Whether you are listening during exercise, in the office, during your commute, or while planning a much-needed summer vacation, we are glad you're here. Joining me once again is executive coach Alyssa Mullet. Hiya. I am a chronic are overplanner. You? Are you? Oh, <laughs> I missed my color-coded <laughs> plethora of things that our audience luckily can't see because it's behind the camera. Uh, it seems almost ridiculous to confirm. Yes. Y- y- yes. With every yes. fiber of my being, I am an overplanner. It's actually probably one of my least favorite qualities to the point of a weakness because I feel like I can (laughs) suck the joy right out of any (laughs) event, upcoming thing. And I, I, sorry, mom, but I get it very honestly and she knows it. Um, (laughs) So this is a learned skill and uh, I'm trying to unlearn it, Mm -hmm. but does it become a problem for you? Have you noticed uh, that ever about yourself? Sometimes. I mean, I will make plans to make plans, and that's a little absurd, right? You know, like I put, <laughs> I plan for time in my planner to do planning, like whether it's on my calendar or whatnot. Uh, my favorite okay. phrase in the whole wide world is, what's the plan? And like to the point mm-hmm. where my kids say it. Like when we wake up in the morning, they'll be like, what's the plan? I'm like, I am so glad you asked. Let's review in bullet point format. Um, and, and, and that's a problem when other people don't want there to be a plan. I've, I've gotten yeah. better at that a little bit, like on vacation. Uh, you know, right, there, right, right. there are days when you're on vacation where you don't want to have a plan. But for me, like as long as I know that that's the plan, I'm good. Right. <laughs> the plan for today is there's no plan. And that's actually a plan. So I'm good. High five. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. I feel you. I just the out of controlness of there not existing any kind of plan is where you kind of draw the line. Is it's okay to not have a plan, but that needs to be, be designated agreed upon as and expressed plan. in advance. <laughs> Thus making it a plan. plan. And I know yes. that, you know, we've talked on here about, about Myers-Briggs before, and I know that, that some of that is from my innate personality preferences. I move through the world and, and see the world as a series of decisions to be made. And I draw a great deal of comfort from organizing the world around me. Uh, and that's why planning is such a big thing. Like my wife even knows, it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of not. Like when I'm in an agitated state of mind, whether I'm, I'm sad or depressed or frustrated, she'll be like, do you want to make a list? <laughs> like, because I know that that makes you feel better. And I'm like, oh, you always know what to say, honey. <laughs> it's like the the beautiful chocolate bar being offered up. Do you want to make a list? <laughs> That's great. I love it. I love That's what it. you get. Yeah, yeah, I get like 18 years with somebody. They know exactly when they're like, yeah, you, you know, some people are like, do you want a glass of wine? And my wife's like, do you want to like write things down, pros and cons? Because that's <laughs> sort of your thing. <laughs> let's let's get into let's it. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, you know, this, this brings up the first segment, which I brought to yes. our conversations of, you know, what can we bring to the podcast, which goes to to ask our bosses out there what is it that we allow we allow to inspire us right mm-hmm. so we have this as over planners right we have this very strategic way of looking at things and this defined terms mm-hmm. under which things make logical sense but when we say inspire that's a maybe it puts it a different context, right? What okay. does that say to you? Inspire. Inspire to me, I equate with energize, 
right? What mm. what lifts you up, or maybe it's maybe it's energy, but maybe it's also mood, right? What moves you into a, a better, more positive mood, or what what lifts raises your energy levels? That's that's the connotation that I get from Inspire. What about you? Okay, so Inspire to me is like this energy of creation, of creativity, sure, yeah. of Sure, of being able to um, have that forward momentum, that motivation that you talk about. But it's also like this deeper ability to shift, whether it's mindset or physically moving forward on a project. Inspiration is something that I think we as a whole of society have defined in these very specific terms. And we don't think about it a whole lot in the context of leadership, mm -hmm. meaning what do we allow to frame in as inspiration in that space? We have what inspires us whenever we're at home and, you know, I, uh, looking at art, maybe mm -hmm. listening to music, right? These are things that we think of as self-care or mm -hmm. nourishing to our spirit versus this mentality of, what's allowable for professional development. I, I can listen to this podcast. Yes, yes, you should listen to this podcast. I can take this seminar. Yes, maybe you should take that seminar. But where can we allow those lines to blur? And what is possible for us as leaders when we can draw upon those things that maybe inspire our soul on a deeper level or our brain in a creative manner and allow that into the professional development space. That's interesting. So is there an argument then? And I think, I mean, I, I'm, it's a rhetorical question, I guess. I'm just reframing what I think I heard you say. An argument could be made then that taking an hour to go to the museum on your lunch break and walking around because it nurtures your soul does translate into being more effective in a leadership role. Do I have it? Is that what you're saying? You got it. You got it. You know, I reflected upon this thought pattern of for years when I was in the corporate space, I would take my lunch however long I took for lunch, whether we call it 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever I took, right? I would eat quickly at my desk mm -hmm. and then my favorite thing to do was to go outside and walk around the local university campus, get into the little bit of a park that was available to me where there was greenery, mm. some kind of nature where I didn't see a screen, right? And being able to connect my feet to pavement, my body to movement, and my eyes to nature always brought me back with a renewed sense of what was possible for me yet to accomplish that day, what I could do to make myself feel better mm -hmm. mentally, right, about the work that I had yet remaining or about the team meetings that I had, how I could help this person or what I might be able perspective I might be able to share. Now, looking back and reflecting upon that, I can say that that's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. But I did not correlate that. And I, I often thought that it was selfish of me mm -hmm. to be, you know, outside of the office gallivanting, if you will, taking my walk. And, and now I can really understand that that was probably one of the most important parts of me showing up for myself and inspiring myself to continue on each and every day. You're making a case, I think, in a lot of ways for, for why it's so important for leaders at all levels to really notice when they're at their best and when they're not, and yeah. to notice the things that influence them in one direction or another. And that noticing can be in the form of just thinking about the time of day or that noticing can be in the form of what types of work or interactions or experiences 
lead to you know my mood and energy going in one direction or another because once we get gather some of that data to use my very logic oriented brain once we collect <laughs> that insight we can plan and respond accordingly i.e if i know that from three to five one day i need to be to be involved in a really difficult meeting or conversation. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that three to five in the afternoon is is n not a good window for me in terms of my sharpness, my focus, my energy. But if I've been taking an inventory of these things and I've been noticing these things, I go, yeah, but you know what? On days when I exercise in the morning and I go in an hour late and stay an hour late just to offset that, I, I, my three to five is actually my two to four and I'm a little sharper. So I'm going to do that on this particular day. Now, I, I haven't talked about the, the art piece of this, but at least in terms of the noticing that you're talking about, yeah. if we open ourselves up to the idea that just because it doesn't fit into the perfect categorization of professional development doesn't mean that it doesn't help us be more effective in our roles, right? I, yes. I have a, a colleague who um, will go to yoga three days a week well, before the pandemic, would go to yoga three days a week during her lunch break for exactly this reason. Yeah, this is what I I, I think is, is what spoke to me about this topic was that we enable work to blur into our personal lives a whole lot easier mm -hmm. than we allow our personal lives to blur into work, meaning looking to that personal, what inspires you personally? How, what do you, when I go out in nature, when I, you know, see art, when I listen to music and allowing that, mm -hmm. noticing, right? And allowing it to inspire you as a professional. It doesn't have to be this defined box of only this for professional development. What's yeah. possible when we allow ourselves the opportunity to inspire, to look to our personal lives to inspire us. I have always shied away from the title of motivational speaker. To me, yeah. it feels like fluff. But hmm. I've had a lot of people come up to me after keynotes or workshops and say, that was so motivational and I'm so inspired. And, you know, I'd like to think that you know, maybe it's in part because of the energy and the fun that we have. But I've always argued that if people come away from a workshop feeling inspired, mm -hmm. it's probably because they have answers. It's probably because they had some kind of experience that sparked a new way of looking at things or they got some new information. They have now ideas that they can go and implement that they didn't have before they came into the room. And so who cares where that comes from? Who cares whether that was sparked by a good speaker or because you were reading a book or because you went to the museum and looked at art? Who cares? The fact is, if we can just notice where we get that from, we might be able to engineer it more often in our professional lives. Yes. Yeah. Screw the judgment, self-inflicted or otherwise. Allow the inspiration into your life, leaders. You know, I got uh, a question on Facebook a couple weeks ago in, in a group that I'm in um, for uh, other trainers, coaches, and consultants. And I thought it was a really interesting question. This was the question. In what ways does your expertise prevent innovation? Mm -hmm. Where does your expertise get in the way of innovation? And I just that, like that question stopped me for a minute. I kind of looked at it and thought, "Ooh, that's like an SAT question. That's an essay question. That's not just a, oh, I know the answer. That's a, I need to think about this and formulate the components of it. And what I arrived at was my expertise stands in the way of innovation because I'm often so busy doing the expert thing that I don't carve out the time to be creative and to find new ideas. Like one of the things I know about myself is my creativity in, is sparked by reading, reading books, by reading how, how other people talk about some of the same sorts of things that I work on. You get new language and new perspectives, but I just, I don't make the time for it that I should. I know that I, I can't even read a book without a notepad next to me. Because I'll read two paragraphs and then I'll have to like jot down something that it sparked in me that I could maybe use later for our audience here on the podcast or in workshops and whatnot. It's almost robbed the joy of reading from me because it, it sparks so much thought 
that I feel like I could use later that not capturing it seems seems like a waste. But what I recognized is when I don't protect time in my schedule to do those things, there is no creativity. There is no innovation. When I allow being an expert or doing my job to be the only thing that I do. And so mm-hmm. if I don't protect that time, I am no longer creative or innovative. And, and what's my lifespan at that point as a professional? What a great insight into this. I, I, that is a, a, a beautiful framework, you know, that we can utilize. And, it, you know, for those of you who are thinking, well, I don't have to be creative in my job. Wrong. Right. Wrong. People are unique and individual creatures. We are creatures of creativity. And as a leader who manages those people, you have to be creative for creating environments in which they will thrive in helping people maximize their productivity, their performance. That cre- that craves creativity. Yes. So you are a part of creating that creativity in your workplace as a leader. And and let's also be clear on what we mean by creativity, because sometimes I think people hear that word and they think of an artist or they think of somebody inventing something or coming up with a new idea. We, we sort of translate being creative with the arts or being artistic yep. in some way. Sure. And when it comes to working as a boss, creativity is, isn't necessarily having a new idea, but it could just be finding the right words for a tough conversation. You know, if, if you know that you you have to figure out a way to communicate something to your team and you're not sure how to make the case for it, but then you give your brain the break that it needs to re-energize and disconnect for a little while, when you come back to that, suddenly the words are there. And that's yeah. creativity. That That is sparked by the to use the term you used earlier, the self-care that you've given to yourself so that you know, all, all of the gears can operate at their highest mm-hmm. levels. Inspiration can come in many forms. And I think that where it comes to me most mm. is in the form of a new perspective. Mm. I, whenever I do something that inspires me, when I allow myself the opportunity and I create that space in which I can be inspired, it inevitably inspires a shift in a perspective Mm -hmm. and that can be applied to so many different aspects of my life personal professional all the boxes so look for ways in which you can be inspired and allow yourself to be inspired well said Before we give you the camaraderie question of the week, know that we'd love to hear your answers on where you draw creativity from, where you draw inspiration from. What do you do that takes care of yourself and makes you better at work? Share your answers with us on the Boss Better Now podcast page or email us, bossbetternow at gmail.com. But we have arrived, Alyssa, to the camaraderie question of the week. Bosses build camaraderie on teams by making it easier for people to find things in common with each other. So every week we give you a question you can use to facilitate connection and build camaraderie. This is a generic question, and it's just a fun one, I think. Alyssa, (laughs) what is something that made you laugh out loud recently? Oh, I I should have cleared this before we went on, quote, quote, unquote, air. Live. (laughs) Yeah, but... I guess we're just going to put it out there. And then if you I mean, need if to it's terrible, I can edit it out later. Right. I mean, we don't usually do that with our recording. Right. So, all right. We, we've you're going to get it, it raw, go. folks, probably. Okay. So <laughs> you're going to laugh and I'm going to try to get through it without laughing. But so this past weekend, we went as a treat to my son, my seven-year-old, to one of his favorite restaurants. And we have not been out to restaurants, let me just tell you, for a long time, like year plus, okay? So we went to his favorite restaurant. And it's a it's a local chain, I think, uh, to Pittsburgh. But they play like all kinds of like a kind of eclectic music. So we're sitting there out on the back patio enjoying our chips and salsa. And the song comes on and... It's kind of uh, reggae-ish, you know, but it's got some kind of weird beats in the back. 
and the the chorus the refrain keeps coming back and i'm like what is that so, the words and the words to me were i looked to my husband and i said is it saying living in a plastic butthole <laughs> <laughs> and he's like what i go the song the song overhead listen to what it's saying <laughs> He's, he instantaneously starts cracking up. He's like, that can't be the words to the song, but you can't unhear it once he, once I said it, you can't unhear it. <laughs> so he actually had to look up the words to this song and it's living in a plastic bubble. Okay. okay? But living in a plastic bubble, living in a plastic bubble. It did not sound like bubble folks. It sounded like butthole and and now, now this whole week, anytime any of us does anything that's like remotely, you know, crazy and or just a little silly, they're like, what are you living in a plastic butthole? That's but amazing. we burst out laughing out loud, all of us. <laughs> uh, that reminds me of there's a CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival song where the lyric yeah. is, uh, there's a bad moon on the rise. And somebody okay. once heard yeah. it as there's a bathroom on the right. And that's all I hear now whenever I hear that song. There's the bathroom on the right. Yeah. <laughs> Same that's kind awesome. of thing. That's a great example. You didn't need to clear that ahead of time. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> oh. All right. So what has made you laugh out loud of late? When I came to this question, I thought I should just answer the first thing that popped in my head. And then, of course, what popped into my head was the dumbest thing ever. But I'm like, all right, I'm just going to share it. And, you know, it is what it is. So I was traveling last week for the first time in 15 months. I did a live on-site yeah. training for a client in Kansas. And um, I will FaceTime with the kids. Um, you're not an Apple product user, Alyssa. Face FaceTime is this glorious video chat you can do with your kids. Um, and on the Apple devices, they have this little feature where you can replace your head with a piece, a clip art cartoon character. And they have all these different okay. ones to choose from. And my four-year-old son, Henry, loves this. He has no interest in talking to me. But when I call, he takes the phone from mommy and he's like, I, look, I'm a this and I'm a this. And on this particular night, he had put up um, a dinosaur and then he was okay. a shark. He's like, I'm a dinosaur. And then he was like, I'm a <laughs> shark. And then he hit this button and what popped up surprised him it was a monkey and he just yelled i'm a monkey and it was the funniest it was the funniest thing i was just like belly laughing himself. at his reaction but then the second part of the story is even better my wife came into his room because he had grabbed the phone and ran into his room um and said all right i'm going to talk to daddy now and she takes the phone and she doesn't realize at first that the character <laughs> thing is still enabled and so for the first 60 seconds of my conversation with my wife she was an owl <laughs> <laughs> and, and i took a screenshot of it on my phone because it was gloriously funny and then she finally was like what is wait how i turn this off you know and, and yeah just one of those moments when you know you're you're chortling heavily at, at things like that so that's what made well, I, me laugh out loud i i will not fail to notice that even the emoji was so appropriate it knew the wisdom of your <laughs> wife so therefore it changed to an owl because it was her well and every time we play with those emojis on the phone my favorite thing to do is to put the owl head on me and just answer everything with who <laughs> Jeez. Who? And I've Such called my dad. mom and I've done that and I've done that. And my kids even now know that I'm going to do it. And it's just glorious dad humor. I love it. It Who? is. It is indeed. <laughs> and that's the camaraderie question of the week. Hey, Boss Heroes, check it out. One of the phone calls I get most often is the we have one person here who really needs help phone call. The leader on the line tells me about an abrasive executive, a manager not meeting the needs of his or her team, or two physicians who can't overcome conflict. Their question is always the same. Do you have any training I could provide for this person? 
I have to tell them the uncomfortable truth. Theirs is a problem that training won't fix. The problems these leaders describe require a different solution, coaching. A professional coach helps people explore new ways of thinking and operating while examining the root causes of their own behavior. When someone needs to examine their approach, adjust their style, become more adaptable, clarify goals, or navigate conflict, there's only one coach I recommend, our own Alyssa Mullet. Alyssa is a professional and executive coach who works one-on-one -on -one with clients to tackle the issues that live behind closed doors. Experienced, credentialed, and revered by her clients, Alyssa can help you or any leader struggling on your team design a path to achievement and professional success. I've sent Alyssa to clients all over the country, and they rave about her every time. Every single time. So if you have that one leader who is struggling, or that one leader is you, I strongly encourage you to invest in coaching. For more information on working with Alyssa or to get a quote, visit joemall.com forward slash coaching. All right, folks, as we used to say back in the day, you've got mail. We should use the old AOL, you've got mail sound for that when we do a mail time segment, <laughs> but that's probably copyrighted. So we'll just stick with our little jingle there. Yeah. I, it's either that or like, what, what was that movie with Tom Hanks? and? The... I believe it was called You've Got Mail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> so either way, it'd be an infringement of some kind or something. Well, but Tom Hanks is welcome on the show anytime, just as a blanket, oh. putting it out there into the universe kind of thing manifest it make it so and if he ever comes on the show i would like to be a part of that even if i'm just a small little dot <laughs> in this in the side of the screen we okay will, that we was a really bad tangent do that it's all good all right <laughs> we got some mail bag yeah we got a great question this week that i thought we would devote a segment to this is from mary in montana and she wrote to us uh, over email and if you want to email the show you want to ask a question just shoot an email over to boss better now at gmail.com Here's Mary's question. Hi, Joe. I'm hoping you and Alyssa can provide some insight. I oversee an entirely remote working staff, and as of late, I've been getting the question, so what does so-and-so do all day anyway, in reference to another employee or staff member? Frankly, this question annoys me. I see how hard they all work. But the I work the hardest and no one else works as hard as I do attitude is rampant. It makes me feel as if I'm possibly not spotlighting their work enough. How can I change this conversation and attitude in our culture? Oh, I have so much to say. But <laughs> I'm going to – it's a short show. We can't have it be like a two-hour workshop. But uh, <laughs> where do you want to start, uh, Alyssa? Well, the one thing I will say is I feel your pain. Was it Mary? Uh, yes that this is so annoying i mean for real did you not like the fact that you didn't like throat punch someone for coming out <laughs> that, that is not an high option five. <laughs> high five to you high five to you <laughs> um the this question is one that i love to go back with another question because that's the coach in me you know mm -hmm. um which is What's most important about that to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that really is, what is it that you're trying to either tell me covertly that you are so much more valuable than so-and-so over there, or why are you so peeved and upset about what it is that they're doing? Mm -hmm. Because you wanted a piece of that action and you didn't get it. You're trying to fight for more on your plate. What What's really going on? So that's my frame of mind. That's my kind of go-to on that. What about you, Joe? I know you have a ton to say on this. In fact, you wrote a book on it, which I think <laughs> everyone should go out and grab. No more team drama because it speaks to all of the ways in which oh, you can you. tackle these types of issues. But give us a little, a little synopsis as what can we impart upon to Mary to say, how can we tackle this? Well, I thank you for the plug, my friend. Yeah, this is something that there's some psychology here, and it's 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 tough to kind of get at all of it 
in like a five or seven minute podcast segment. But um, a couple of things, first and foremost, Mary, in part, you did sort of answer your own question. You said, maybe this makes me feel like if I'm possibly not spotlighting their work enough. And, and that is certainly the tactical response to wanting to maybe prevent this. If you work in an organization and you want people to have a deeper, more sophisticated understanding of how their teammates spend their time all day, then spotlighting their work more often, asking them to present a little bit more about what what challenges they face in their role or the kinds of, of sophisticated problems they solve or the expertise they are required to bring to their work is a great way to sort of constantly keep people in the loop. It's also sort of a mini version of cross-training. That way, if you ever had an interest in moving people around or people wanted to try their hands at different things, they have a better flavor of what else is going on around them in their, in their areas. But there's some underlying psychology here that's taking place. Let's, let's look at the what does so-and-so do all day anyway. If we look at the, the underlying assumption, it's that this person's getting away with something. Mm-hmm. Right. It's this kind of, well, they might be lazy or, or they're unskilled. And um, these are character defects. And mm-hmm. one of the things that we know is that there's a shortcut our brains take. It even has a name. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And what it is, is your brain tells you that when you see someone do something that you don't understand or agree with, it's because of their character not because Mm -hmm. of their circumstances. And so in other words, when you see someone do a questionable thing, your brain tells you they're of questionable character. And when I do workshops on this stuff, I'll ask a room full of people, what do you assume about somebody who's late to work? And the first five answers are they're lazy, they didn't plan, they don't care, they don't try. These are all character defects. Mm -hmm. Well, what was the reason the last time you were late to work? Well, my, my kid spilled orange juice on my lap right before I had to leave the house and I needed to change my pants. So there's a, this shortcut that our brain takes. It fills in the gaps, and it tells us that the people around us have character defects. The other shortcut our brains take is about ourselves, and that's related to the other part of what Mary is asking about here, this notion of I work harder than everybody else does and nobody knows it. There's another shortcut our brains take, which is called the illusory superiority bias, which says that we overestimate our own capacity, our own capabilities, our own knowledge, Right. If you ask everybody in a company um, to rate their contributions on a scale of one to five, nobody picks a two. Almost nobody <laughs> picks a three. Amen. Yeah. People probably pick a three point something or a four. Right. We believe that, and this is the other shortcut. Our brains tell us, "I'm a really good person, doing the best I can most of the time." That illusory superiority bias shows up where we even overestimate our own suffering. When somebody comes to you and tells you how hard they have it, we respond by saying, well, if you think that's hard, wait till I tell you what I'm going through. Yeah. And, and so these two biases work hand in hand on teams, right? We more favorably judge ourselves and we more harshly judge others than we should. And so I'm going to go right back to the coaching question that you threw out. Uh, I like a little bit of a different version of it, which okay. is when somebody says, why is so-and-so, what does so-and-so do? do all day anyway well what makes you say that what makes you ask that and you know why is that important i think is the question that you asked which is great it's another fantastic way to to get at this which is like and here's another one what are you getting at Hmm. because if you ask hey what are you getting at with that question that that kind of will stop people in their tracks and be like i was just you know curious (laughs) like if you don't want people to assume that you're getting away with murder then maybe we can all agree not to let everybody not to assume that everybody else is getting away with murder Doing it. right right wow i think my brain just had a little mini explosion there from all the learning that it just <laughs> crammed into it as the most i've i've learned in in a short amount of time and i can't tell you how long so thank you joe that I was po- you you triggered a mini keynote because i talk about those biases <laughs> in my no more team drama keynote so it just kind of blah just fell out and so you you triggered me i'm sorry <laughs> don't ever be sorry for that kind of trigger. I love it. It's great. <laughs> I think our audience benefited greatly. You know, and, and so let's give Mary these tools then. So we talked about, yes, Mary, spotlight some of their behaviors more. Um, in one-on-one conversations, ask, why is that important? What makes you say that? What are you getting at? Point out the underlying assumptions and say, hey, if you're, you know, if you're going to assume that people are getting away with something, where does that come from? Uh, and, yeah. and the way we flip that around is instead, ask people to assume good intent. 
What would make a really good person act this way? What's more likely, that they're secretly getting away with being lazy or that maybe we just don't talk a lot about what other people do with their time? What do you think is more likely? And then, yeah, doing those things that you can to to shine a light on people's duties, how they spend their time, to do some cross-training, to do some shadowing. Um, I think that's a great path to this, to, to overcoming this as well. Oh, and one more thing. I have no problem with a boss responding to these kinds of comments and questions with a, a little little tiny bit of an edge. Be like, hold on, time out. That is annoying. That is frustrating. That's crappy. Like, I would never, I would not don't want people to be treated that way here. I don't want to want you to ever uh, have anybody questioning you in that way. And I'm not going to let you do it to others. You know, if you, if you yeah. feel like that they're getting away with something, go ask them. Yep. You know, we're about to Ooh, I like it here. sassy. I like sassy Joe. Bring in the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's mail time. So we'd love to hear from you again. Send us your questions, your topics to boss better now at gmail.com. Well, that's our show this week, Boss Heroes. We are so grateful that you are with us. Please take a moment to share these episodes and clips on your social media with those around you. It makes a huge difference for us as we try to grow this show, grow this audience, and serve your boss's soul. Until next time, thanks for all that you do to take care of so many. This show is sponsored by Joe Mall and Associates. Remember, commitment comes from better bosses. Visit joemall.com today. 